When you're building wealth, you will often attract money unexpectedly. Unfortunately, this can cause the curse of a sudden windfall. Hi, I'm Justin Hit with Sustainable Wealth Secrets. Let's talk sh- briefly about the challenges of a sudden windfall of money. Now, this could be you sell your business and now all of a sudden you're flush with cash and you, you've got a couple million dollars, you don't know what to do with it. Someone could have passed away in your family, left you with an inheritance. Uh, you could get the results of a marketing campaign. I, I share the story very often about a client who called and they had a million dollars in cash. There was a seasonal event. It was a roofing company. They were able to produce a million dollars in cash by doing roofs uh, in storm areas. Now, they wanted to buy another business and get into another type of business. And I asked them the question. I said, look, well, how did you get this money in the first place? Uh, And so that's probably the first lesson. If a windfall comes to you, whether it's a cash surge in your business, whether it's a bonus check at the end of the year that's bigger than you expected, whether it's an inheritance or the sale of a business, you have to ask the question, how did we get this money? Where did it come from? What was the mechanism to put it in place? So this particular roofing contractor ended up with a million dollars in cash. That was the net value of lots of hard work. And the concept of where did the money come from gives you both an idea of where you can get the money again, but also gives you a little context about how difficult it was to get the money. Now, money is very easy if you understand the principles that we discuss in this program. Then again, if money suddenly shows up like winning the lottery, most people blow it. I'll tell you right up front, when I was young, I went through millions of dollars and just didn't know what I was doing with it. So I had a computer consulting business that grew during the dot-com. During the dot-com, people would just give you like $35,000 checks to do basic computer stuff. I didn't understand it. And the money would just keep rolling in. And money was really easy coming in. And there were times I'd get $100,000 for a job. We were migrating data centers. Now, I was hiring contractors to do the work. And very often I would pay a premium for the contractors because I had certain uh, demands on what they did because I wanted to get the work done in a reasonable amount of time and simply just burn through the money. Uh, Let's let's go back to the, the lottery winners. What usually happens with a lottery winner is they go broke because they had the skills. Well, they didn't have the money skills, but they had skills to go buy lottery tickets, which really has no applicable value if you suddenly win a million dollars. And then as soon as you win the million dollars, everybody and their brothers trying to get that money from you. And so you have to understand that when you get a sudden windfall, a couple emotional things will happen. First off, you might think you don't deserve it. The money suddenly shows up. You weren't ready for it. You might not think you deserve it. And that emotional feeling very often means you're just simply going to spend it. Number two is that when you get a bunch of money show up, Everybody wants to spend it. Easy money. Easy come, easy go. Number three is you may not have the skills to be handling a million dollars or handling more money. You may be very comfortable in your life. You may be saving and and building uh, wealth. You've invested in listening to this program. And then suddenly you get this windfall and you don't realize the rules change. For every million dollars you have in a bank, you're going to produce about $40,000 in return. That's a balanced portfolio with a 4 to 8% return, and it could be dividends, it could be appreciation, it could be a lot of things, but it's going to change your tax position. If you're already making $100,000 a year and you make another $40,000, or you're already making $200,000 a year and you make another $100,000, you will have a change in tax position. Now, if you go to your accountant or CPA and say, look, I just got another million dollars, they're going to have dollar signs in their eyes. They're going to want to spend that money for you. They're going to say, oh, pay off all your debt. Well, if your cost for cap per capital is very low, why pay off the debt? They might say, oh, get in the stock market. Stock market's doing really good. Well, if your CPA t- or an accountant tells you to get in the stock market, they're not brokers. They're not qualified to tell you this. Very often, people are going to tell you an answer just to tell you an answer. You're also going to have social pressure and, and possibly even a feeling of guilt about this money. 
You've got this inheritance. You didn't earn it. It's kind of just showed up. Maybe we should give it to charity. You know, I saw a comment. I'm watching this show about intergenerational wealth and how to keep the money from generation to generation. And I see in the comments the statement that intergenerational wealth is the leading cause of income inequality. It's kind of a retarded statement because somebody went and earned that money. Somebody made really good decisions. Again, this is why you want to learn the story of that money. You want to know about the person. How did they get this money? Now, they could have been a a bastard and a drug dealer or whatever. You know, you find out these things. But more likely, they invested time, money, and resources. And over time, they had a, a, a bit of luck. They had a bit of skill. And they had a bit of putting it aside. Now, it is very possible that they had different passion areas. And if you want to give away some money, you can structure it the right way so that you can give that money away. But my advice is, despite the emotional feelings, despite the social pressures, you know, no matter what happens, you're going to put that money away and sit on it for a year or two. Now, if you put the money away and it's generating a 4% return and you're able to take the the dividends and go do something with that, that'll satisfy that desire to finally take the vacation you ever wanted. You know, you're going to have people tell you that you deserve a vacation. Oh my gosh, you've gotten this windfall. You deserve a vacation. Most of the time you got people try to hit you up for money. It's just really what happens. But ultimately, um, if you didn't have the skills to earn it, you may not have the skills to keep it. So put the money in a balanced portfolio, and usually you do this by maxing out your your 401k, maxing out your uh, high uh, saving, uh, health savings account by buying the right insurance. But again, don't do that with the principle of the money. Do that with the yield of the money and preserve that principle. And frankly, if you've received a windfall of over a million dollars, there is a temptation to get that fancy car you always wanted. But wouldn't it be better to still have the million dollars and have the fancy car? Because you're not, you're not going to not be able to do it. You just may need to get things settled so that the money is multiplying, buying assets to cash flow, for example. But doing it with the proceeds, because if you're generating a 4% return on the money with the money just sitting in the bank, you know, pretty much you ignore it and it's simply uh, growing and maybe you're getting the 4% return and half of the return you're spending as part of your daily expenses uh, and the other half you're reinvesting. Well, that money's going to grow. But it also gives you a good baseline as to what you should be doing with the money beyond. So you've let the money sit for a year. You've been reinvesting every penny. Now, because you didn't have a need before, you know, you didn't even know the money was coming. So you didn't have a need before. Why expand your lifestyle? Why increase your expenses? Why buy something on a whim that may cost you in the future? The money's growing. Then you say, okay, what do I want to do? Put the money aside. What do you want to do? Then you write up what you want to do in a, in a quick analysis. How much is it going to cost? What are the benefits? What are the potential liabilities? Why do I want this? Then you ask the question, if I do this, will it have a benefit to me greater than the percentage return I get doing nothing? This is kind of an opportunity cost analysis. And now there's more in-depth ways of doing this. I've talked about it in other programs. Uh, You can do a SWOT analysis. You can do a lot of fancy things. But the key is if I take this money and do something with it, am I spending the money? Because think about it. When you spend, the money ends. Am I Or am I circulating this money by investing it wisely, being a good steward of these funds, and then multiplying the funds? Now, a lot of people tell me, hey, I got this big cash surge. Which of these charities should I give to? I'm not saying you don't give to charity. 
I would much rather you own your own foundation or nonprofit and you give it to your own foundation or nonprofit. I would prefer like a charitable remainder trust. I would prefer some kind of investment that spends off the money. I don't know if you remember the story I shared about the real estate investor whose kid asked for money for college and he said, how much do you need? And she gave a number for how much she needs each month. Each month, And so he said, let me show you how to create this money every month. So I think the college tuition would have been about $50,000 a year. He went and bought a house for like twenty dollars or $30,000. Uh, she helped fix it up over the summer. And then he essentially gave her the rent. So she needed five or $600 a month. He gave her five or $600 a month, but it was the proceeds – of the investment. So what did this mean for the for the parent? It meant his daughter got a valuable lesson that you can create money on demand. He ended up with an asset rather than a liability because instead of giving the school $50,000, he put that $50,000 in an asset that cash flowed and he simply gave the cash flow to the school itself. There's a whole bunch of other benefits, but do you see the concept that windfall makes you kind of think, well, I could just give the kid – I could give the kid some money to, so they can have a nice house. I could give the kid some money to pay off their student loans. But wouldn't it be better to keep the money and be able to help the kid or even better, help the kid have a lesson to pay for it themselves? Now, the, one of the best things to do is not let anybody know you got the money because um, – you know, even the government is going to want some. There are going to be changes in your tax circumstances. There might be local government officials that kind of want a piece of that money. You know, if you're upgrading your house and doing all these remodeling, and word gets out on the street that that you've got some money, I guarantee your home assessments going up, and your property taxes will go up. Now, a lot of folks will feel compelled to give the money to a broker because maybe the broker is smarter than they are in in, in this kind of belief, and they're going to invest the money. I I have a whole program on a balanced portfolio. You don't need to hire an investor if you're just going to let the money sit. Now, if you get a million, two million, three million, you might become a qualified investor, and you might want to work with hedge funds folks. But do that after the first year or two. Think about it. You get a million dollars. And you got $40,000 a year that you can spend without hurting the principal. It's really a concept that most people don't have. They off most, the psychology of most people is that if they got a windfall of money, and this is why I call this the curse of a sudden windfall, they get a windfall of money that now they can just start buying stuff. You know, they can get all the things that they've always wanted. And some people even say, well, my grandpa. You know, the, the reason he left me this money is because he wanted me to enjoy it. And that's why money and wealthy people lose all their money in, in two or three generations. The first generation earns it, the second generation spends it, and the third generation just blows it all, gets rid of it all. That's because the second generation didn't have the skills necessary to move forward. If you put the money in the bank, not necessarily like a bank account, but like in a common brokerage, uh, again, it doesn't have to be all of it in a money market account. It can go to fully fund your health insurance for the year. If you own a business, it could be in a uh, qualified 401k plan or a personal 401k plan. It could be if you have a charitable organization or a foundation that you control, it could be up to 50% of your income into that foundation to kind of uh, tax shelter the money. It could be, for example, um, you don't necessarily take the money directly and put it in your 401k, but you max out your 401k to the limit because you don't really need the cash because you're getting this uh, the, these dividends off the off the money. And if you're financially stable right now, then why not just let the money ride in investments with the, those that cash being reinvested so that your nest egg is growing? Remember. There's the only difference between a million dollars and ten million dollars is a zero, and a zero really isn't anything anyway. So putting the money aside, let it ride for a year, having written plans to approach how you might spend the money, or you might invest the money, or you might circulate the money, demanding of that money that it that it doesn't do anything until it can do better than it's doing right now. 
So if you're getting a 4% return in a balanced portfolio and and you're going to take $100,000 out to do something, will that $100,000 produce a better yield on the money than it doing nothing? And I'm not advocating you do nothing forever. What I'm saying is that you allow the dust to settle and you handle the emotional part, you handle the skills part, you handle, you know, folks going to ask you and hit you up for money. Uh, you get all that taken care of. Now, when you're working with financial advisors and different people, and you let's say you got $10 million, you don't go tell them you just got $10 million. Okay, so there's some mindset elements here. You say, hey, look, I've come into about a million dollars. I'm I'm interviewing people to find out what I should do with this money. What do you propose? And they're going to propose all kinds of things. And you say to them, that sounds interesting. Can you can you give me an outline on paper? I'm a little confused about what you're sharing. Give me an outline on paper. Meanwhile, again, the money's riding in the bank. You're getting dividends off the money. You're reinvesting those dividends. You've paid all your critical stuff. So, for example, if you've got a, a term life insurance policy, you can pay the premiums for the whole year and sometimes get a 3 to 5% discount on your premiums. Uh, very often, if you already have a 401k or a Roth IRA or a personal 401k in a business, you can just fully fund it at the beginning of the year. It's really about free net cash flow. If you exclude the lump sum and you just look at increasing the free net cash flow, you will very often make really good decisions. Now, again, I'm not a financial advisor. I'm not your guru or financial advisor. And certainly you shouldn't be listening to the folks on TV because um, a lot of their windfall stories are like, pay off all your debt and uh, you get that new car that you've always wanted. No, this is about uh, making decisions so that basically you get in a situation where you don't need a job. You don't need any outside income. You've got it all taken care of. You might even become your own bank. You might even self-fund your health insurance. And those are complex topics we can talk about some other time. So again, you're going to invest the funds in a balanced portfolio just to try to determine what your base earnings would be. Uh, next, you're going you're gonna to write up any plan on paper and run the numbers to see whether this idea you have, because you're going to have some wild-ass ideas, uh, that this idea is going to uh, preserve my principal and yield a higher return than the money simply being invested. Uh, number three is you're going to set up your own bank and uh, even even borrow money. F- so you can put the money in a trust, for example, and then borrow the money from the trust or, or put the money into some kind of uh, reserve fund or custodial account. It's really – you're really going to sit down with a lawyer, a CPA, and a tax attorney. Uh, you might put the money in a reserve account to cover taxes because you're going to have a different tax position. just depends on how you got the money. But you're going to basically be your own bank. You're going to live off the interest, and you're going to preserve that asset, which is that lump sum. Next, you're going to see how long you can go without spending it and seek to double the money. Now, I know somebody gave you this money. You got it. You sold a business. It's the, finally you cashed out. If you You want to spend it. <laughs> However... If you can double the money first as you're getting into what is the best way to apply this money or how can you best steward this money, you very often can double it in five to seven years. And now you've got twice as much, and that's an easier problem to solve because the original money never got spent. It never it, – it circulated. It got invested. It got multiplied, and now you're in a position where no matter how much you spend, you still got more money than you can deal with. And number five and last – I want you to think about self-care. I want you to think about reserving funds to cover assets. I want you to think about your proper insurance, your health for both health and life insurance, and then start uh, with with a qualified uh, advisor. You're going to start building out that perpetual multi generational wealth. Look, I don't care what the rest of the world says when it comes to to generational wealth. Imagine what life would be like if you could leave both the wisdom of how to manage the money and grow the money and the opportunity to your children, your grandchildren, 
or even generations down the line. Now, a lot of times folks will set up a foundation so that the money is managed like this because it is very tempting to cut a check. If you can write a check for a million dollars, it's very tempting to do that because it, the feeling is just amazing. And it, and it feels it's exciting to, to brag about the money or to show the money or to go into your country club and pay a year's worth of dues like all at once. You've you got to be humble about this. You've got to be focused about this because if you double that initial uh, windfall, the confidence you'll have – that you can manage this money, the guilt will melt away. The financial pressures that you may have had in the past will vaporize. And you'll be in a position where you can sincerely do anything you want. You'll have financial freedom, financial security, and you'll have the ability to, the skills, the skill set, to keep that going. Again, think very carefully If you can turn a lump sum or an inheritance into generational wealth, then you can do anything. And and you'll end up being in a a position where you'll just know things are taken care of. You can adjust your lifestyle. You don't necessarily want to go on the luxury side. I still still believe in intentional thrift, intentional thrift, not theft. I thought I was thinking about the government there because there will be a point where if you got a lot of money, you're the enemy of the government because politicians worry about that kind of stuff, um, especially in today's climate. But ultimately, you're going to end up with more options and you're going to end up with a way to determine which option is best for you and you're going to be your own person when it comes to this. Your family will be taken care of for generations. That's really what we're going for when we talk about sustainable wealth secrets. And these are secrets because if you go Google or go look at Reddit or whatever, what should I do with a million dollar inheritance? The the, oh man, the question, the the answers are everywhere. Give yourself a year to read and talk to qualified individuals and 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 come up with a written plan. And and trust me, you're going to be way better off. I'm Justin Hit with Sustainable Wealth Secrets, and we've been talking about the curse of a sudden windfall. And how very often when people get a lot of money all at once and they don't have the skills to grow it, they will very often lose every penny. And while you might be scared about something like that, this plan of letting that money sit, coming up with a baseline, using written plans, all of these things are going to take you to the next level. Now, if you have any questions about what we covered here, or you want additional details about your situation, write my office with your question. Visit www.sustainablewealthsecrets.com. Ask your questions in writing. I am so much easier to understand when I reply to you in writing than when we talk in, in this podcast format. I want to thank you for listening. I'm here to help affluent uh, individuals and families build generational wealth, build wealth and value that cannot be taken away and the skill set that even if you do lose it all, you'll just get it right back. Thanks for listening.